So where does this all lead? Well, what it actually ends up leading to are, are some interesting developments. Number one, what you end up getting um, in, in modern theology is deism. Reason becomes so important um, that um, you, you end up with many people pushing for science and things like that. So God merely becomes kind of the source of creation, a basis of morality and truth, but is really separated from daily and cultural life. Uh, you also get liberal theology where God gets interpreted through human experience. So for Hegel, it's reason. Schleiermacher, it's his feeling of dependence. And then for Kant, it was it was morality. And so again, it's, it's as if Christianity and religion get reduced to kind of this kind of human experience. But you also then get this reaction that becomes a form of fundamentalism that I would argue is just as problematic. Um, it becomes so otherworldly, where Christianity isn't about this world, it's about dying and going to heaven and, and so on. And it's a reaction to liberal theology and deism, um, but it's not helpful. Um, and so modern theology kind of develops in these different trajectories. Um, but then we get people like Bart and Bonhoeffer and others that we'll talk about here in, in a little bit. Now, you also get kind of the conditions for atheism. So remember, we started this course by kind of talking about the conditions of our belief. So what would cause someone around Martin Luther's time to not be able to reject a belief in God? They could not not believe in God. Well, again, think of all the Platonic and Aristotelian stuff. The philosophical stuff just made too much sense. The focus on spirit, uh, on God is 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 um, holy and perfect and spiritual and all of that. But now what you're getting is a move with Descartes to the self. And you begin to move into skepticism with Hume. You get the subjective move with Kant, which, which again, is putting it on the human person. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, why do we need God? Or what is God? Is God merely another name for human consciousness? If you think about Hegel. Um, eventually you get people saying maybe God is merely a projection of the human self. And Hegel and Schleiermacher and others, there would be so something to talk about there. Um, and then you get to Karl Marx who comes along and, you know, we don't have time to talk about Karl Marx, but he would, you know, say it's a projection of cultural ideology. And so, <clears throat> again, you move from this idea of that the, the God is the highest thing and the, a philosophical system that creates conditions of belief that that posit God as this divine kind of highest thing that then moves down to the material. And now through Descartes and some of these other things, we're making kind of this human turn where the conditions of belief are focusing much more on reason, our material existence, the human self, uh, and so on. And so it begins to raise some significant questions about a, a belief in God. Now, this may seem strange, but I'm asking you to read uh, The Parable of the Madman. Uh, it's very short, um, and I've loaded it up on, online for you. But um, you get this philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, who uh, refers to the death of God. And Nietzsche is often kind of seen as the enemy of Christianity. But what we want to do here a little bit is, is question that. Um, so, so what Nietzsche began to see is he began to critique his culture. Um, he began to see that through reason and some of the things that we've been talking about, they developed this, this very kind of uh, rationalistic culture that was oppressing human life. And so he would talk about, um, you know, Apollo as being the god of music and the god of order, and Dionysius, who was the god of wine, and believed that the modern culture needed a little more Dionysius. So he writes this book called Thus Spake Zarathustra, which is the opposite of the um, allegory of the cave. Rather than coming up out of the cave into the sun, Zarathustra starts up into the sun and goes down to humans um, to help them kind of embrace their material existence. Now, he also talks about the death of God, but this is important. For Nietzsche, what he's taking on is the death the concept of God that they had created. He is actually attacking, if you read the parable of the madman, he's attacking the deists. He's attacking those who want to reduce God to a concept, who want to capture God 
in their kind of conceptual framework. Um, this is what he means by the death of God. And as we'll see here in, in a little bit when we get to Karl Barth, there is a form of atheism and a form of Nietzsche that we as Christians, I wonder, if, if we couldn't agree with, that when we turn God into a concept and try to make God fit into our rational concepts or our cultural concepts, we end up creating an idol. We end up creating a God who is not God. And so we'll see Bart actually would make the argument that there is a form of atheism that we can come alongside and say amen to, not because we don't believe in a God, uh, but we don't believe in that kind of rationalistic uh, concept of God. Now, uh, we won't go into more with Nietzsche, but he, he believes that humanity is actually um, evolving into the, the overman or the superman. Uh, and, and he uses the analogy of a tightrope walker. So this is uh, a guy who put a tightrope in between the Twin Towers back in the 70s. There's a movie that was just made about it um, and believes that modern man is is the bridge. So moving from in history, from um, earlier in history to the overman or the superman, uh, modern man is something that, that needs to be overcome. And so he writes in his Thus Spake Zarathustra, um, Zarathustra, however, looked at the people and wondered, then he spoke thus, Man is a rope stretched between the animal and the overman, a rope over abyss, a dangerous crossing, a dangerous wayfaring, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous trembling and halting. What is great in man is that he's a bridge and not a goal. What is lovable in man is that he's an overgoing and a downgoing. I love those that know not how to live except as downgoers, for they are the overgoers. I love the great despisers because they're the great adorers and arrows of longing for the other shore. I love those who do not first seek a reason beyond the stars for going down and being sacrifices, but sacrifice themselves to the earth that the earth may become the overman. All right. Now you may say, this is weird. Why are we talking about this? Think about this analogy. How often do we use belief in God as a reason or an excuse never to act? So, an example, how many times have you heard people say, well, I know God has that spouse out there for me. And we use God's will, this abstract notion of God's will, to make ourselves feel better about the fact that we don't have a date. And not only that, but it keeps us from actually asking anyone, taking the risk to ask anyone out on a date. See, what ends up happening is our concept of God makes us irresponsible. We no longer have to act. We no longer have to do anything. And what, Zara, what, what Nietzsche is trying to say by saying we, God is dead and we have killed him, the death of God then means now that as humans, we are responsible to act and live in the world. So that's what he's trying to say. Now, I don't agree with Nietzsche the full way, but what I want you to begin to think about is when we get to Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer, one of his primary conversation partners, is Friedrich Nietzsche. And he is going to argue for the same thing. We don't get to just say, well, God's will, God's will, and then never act. We are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. We are called to be responsible for our neighbor. So that for Bonhoeffer, Christi the true Christianity is, isn't this abstract God that we construct? True Christianity means love and loving our neighbor in a way that Nietzsche might not agree with, but he might respect. Now, Karl Barth comes along, and Karl Barth is, is one of the theologians who is going to um, uh, basically question the whole liberal theological project. And what he says is, so when we talk about Hegel, when we talk about Schleiermacher, when we talk about liberal theology, are we actually talking about God or are we talking about humanity? And so what Bart wants to emphasize is the primacy of revelation. We can't get to God. God has to reveal God's self. So I want you to see the difference. Hegel, Schleiermacher, right? Kant even, there's an emphasis upon human action. And what can we say about God through human action? Bart is saying, no, God is the one who must act first. Humanity only knows God by God speaking God's word. 
about who God is. At the center of theology for Karl Barth is a radical sense of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God has spoken a word about who God is and what it means to be human. So again, this is a theology from above. Um, now, he sees the resurrection as an event, this thing that cannot be fully understood or, or grasped. Uh, and and he's, what he's arguing here is, again, this is a revelation of who God is. Now, the other thing that he does that I think is really important, Bart is against natural theology. And he has this exchange with someone, a, a friend of his, um, Bruner was his name. Bruner was trying to make the argument for natural theology, knowing God and creation. And Bart wrote a response that was just had the title, Nine, No. Um, now, why? Well, think about, where did, where did Hegel lead? Where, where did liberal theology lead? Where did natural theology lead? It led to the Nazis. Uh, and so Bart is opposed to natural revelation. Because it always leads to idolatry, if you could remember what we talked about with Calvin. For Bart, it always leads to the God who's not God. And this is where Bart wants to talk about a Christian form of atheism. That we need to reject these concepts of God that are much more what we think God should be like, rather than the revelation of who God is. So, just look at the, the bolded part here where he's talking about the, the, the Christian West. He says, Christian, properly understood, means being governed by the message of Jesus Christ, the liberating discovery of God's gracious move towards humanity. But such discovery is an event, not a condition or institution, and thus is not an attribute with which human creations can be endowed or by which they can be distinguished, nor are we governed by that event but at best only distantly touch it. The truth of the matter is that we still have really and probably to learn what is involved in this essential Christianity, and thus with the happy reversal in which God moves ahead and man follows. Again, the action is God acts, and we then respond to God's action. Now, this is where he has talks about atheism. Listen to what he says. Atheism is not abominable, evil, dangerous, or pernicious in either of these forms. So he's talking about Eastern communism, but also kind of the scientific form. Now, look at this bold part here. He says, the atheism that is the real enemy is the Christianity that professes faith in God very much as a matter of course, perhaps with great emphasis, and perhaps with righteous indignation at atheism wild or mild, while in its practical thinking and behavior, it carries on exactly as if there were no God. It professes be its belief in him, lauds and praises him, while in practice he is the last of the things it thinks about, takes seriously, fears, or loves. All right, I won't go on. You can read the rest. But what he's basically saying is that we as Christians, we sit there and say, oh, we're against atheism, we're against atheism, and we make people watch God is not dead and, and congratulate ourselves. But his argument is we tend to live like atheists. And so we need to be living by the revelation of God, not who we think God should be. And that we need to be careful that we're not constructing, constructing our own idols. Bard has some fascinating other aspects to his theology. So his understanding of salvation, the sending of the Son into the far country. The Father sends the Son into humanity to take the human experience into the divine life. Um, God does not know sin. God does not know death. And what Bart would say is that God comes in Jesus Christ to enter into these things so that he can be all in all and therefore reconcile all of humanity and all of creation um, to God. The other thing Bart does well is he talks about election. But he, what he wants us to recognize is that Jesus Christ is the elect one. So if you read Ephesians, what you would find is that we're elect and we're predestined and all of these things, but it's always in Christ. So think of it this way. Before the foundations of the world, before God even chose, decided to create, in Jesus Christ, God decides to be for his creation. This is what election is about. It is about God's posture to be for creation, to deal with the consequences of freedom and sin and love and all of those things. Now, I put 
Julian of Norwich here, because if you remember, Julian has this this picture of the servant, the Lord and the servant, right? And, and the servant going out, falling into a pit, and then you know, coming and being uh, saved. Um, and then Jesus is the one who is the second Adam who goes into the pit and, and brings us out. Well, Julian and, and Karl Barth are very similar to one another and their understanding of the sending of the Son into the far country and even this understanding of election. You know, when Julian says, all will be well, and wants to emphasize love, you can kind of read in Barth's understanding of election something, something similar. The other thing that I think is important um, is his notion of secular parables, that Barth believes that the kingdom of God is breaking into this world, and that as the Christian community, we are called to, to participate in, in that. But it doesn't mean that we have the corner on the market on the kingdom of God. And it doesn't mean that there aren't other cultural places where God is at work in the world. Um, can God be at work bringing his kingdom in a, a people and an institution that is not necessarily Christian? So this is where, for Bart, cultural stuff can, can come in, and we can begin talking about what he calls secular parables of the kingdom of God, where we can partner in, in politics and economics and, and whatever um, with people who may have entirely different beliefs than us. Um, but again, it, it, these are impulses of the kingdom of God.